We're ready to be on topic. What do you guys think? <laughs> um, this is our room captain, so. Thank you for coming to Lux Best Northwest 2018. This is Deb Nicholson. Thanks. All right. Um, so today's uh, topic, Harmonize and Resist, a global survey of strategies for freedom and free software. So we're going to... We're going to look at the ways that different countries have responded to pressure from the U.S. and some of its allies to harmonize. Whenever you hear harmonize in conjunction with like patent or copyright law, you should be suspicious. Um, and, then, uh, and then look at what different places are doing to resist that. Um, you can tweet at me, bacon and coconut. Uh, this is my email uh, if you want to talk about patents and defensive patent pools particularly. And uh, I'd be happy to hear from you. So I started thinking about this topic because I had a conversation, like maybe now, like two years ago, with a friend of mine, and he was saying, "So what if we do this? Or what if we do this? Like, and how does this license work if we're gonna like, you know, go to Indonesia and on all, all these different questions?" And I'm, and you know, I'm not actually a lawyer, but I gave him the lawyerly answer. Is like, well, it depends. And he's like, well. And he's like, well, well, okay, but for like right now. And I'm like, yeah, for right now, but policy is always changing. So, and he's like, oh, what we just want is certainty. I'm like, yeah, totally. I, I completely understand that. Like, I, I want my toothbrush in the same place when I wake up every day. You know, and that's like a reasonable place to expect a certain amount of certainty, right? Um, the global political landscape with regards to patents and copyrights, not so much. Um, it would be very nice to have everything be like super orderly and be like, okay, so this continent, you know, patents, all of them are, are, uh, are patent, like all pieces of software are patentable, and then over here, none of them, and there's no shades of gray, no mix and match. It's not going to happen. And in fact, I think we don't want it to happen. Sometimes the best stuff is the weird stuff. <laughs> so, um, the way that the economy is arranged in different countries is not the same as it's arranged here. And innovation sometimes comes from like the, the weird parts where it's like, oh, it's actually a little bit different here than it is somewhere else. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about the $5 telephone, cell phone from India. And it's like that economy is uniquely set up to produce such an innovation. Um, so policy is always changing. And trying to stuff it back in the box usually leads you down this path of like, did all that totalitarian stuff just come out of my mouth? Like, oh, <laughs> shoot. Never mind. Okay, be messy. Do whatever you want. Innovate, like, and, and have a big, you know, we'll just have a, a completely different IP policy in every single country, which honestly probably makes the most sense, um, even if it is annoying and a little bit more work to deal with. So... So the policy is always changing, um, but the computing is also always changing. Um, I mean, not, obviously, this is probably not news to you, but in some really specific ways, uh, computing is always changing, and our relationship to computing is always changing. So um, this is a DMARC from uh, Australia, and it's a, really, it's a really old computer, you can tell because of the black and white photograph. Um, and there's more ladies than men in the picture. Um, ooh, and the sorry. hairstyles. <laughs> and the hairstyles, yes. Although, I have no, yeah. Like, those ladies are technical. I could never get my hair to be that picture. Um, also, so this is, they're sharing. This back part is the storage and the data. These are input devices here. So. Um, so computing used to be this thing, like, you didn't have personal control over it because it would be a shared device. You had to, like, sign up for time on, uh, with your boss. Like, you'd have to be like, oh, can I use the DMARC for my thing, like, from 2 p.m. until 3 p.m.? And then you had to, like, get it all in there and have it all spit out. You know, and it became a little, a little bit more spread out, but, um... The, the earliest part of computing was it was a giant shared device that you had to use for things that your colleagues and your boss agreed that it was, you know, an acceptable use of computer time. Um, and then we created the portable computer, which, um, does anyone watch Halt and Catch Fire? All right, it's a TV show about early computing, and there's like a couple like scenes in there where they're like, 
We just got to get it down to 22 pounds. And then it'll be a real portable. It's like, oh, 22 pounds. Um, so this is kind of, this is a little later. This probably only weighs like 19 pounds. But um, so the, the push to have a computer that you control, that you could do whatever you wanted with. And this was like 60s, 70s. Like people were like, the personal computer, we're going to like, you know, bootstrap our minds and be able to do whatever we want. Like we're going to be free. It's going to be amazing. We're still going to have to carry this 22-pound thing around. But it's going to be ours. It will belong to us, which is great. Um, except they weren't that powerful on their own, unfortunately. So, um, you know, so you gave up, like, computing power, but it belongs to you. It's in your house. You don't have to ask your boss for permission. Um, you know, so you have this, like, pendulum going back and forth. And, I, you know, like, what's this? There's this question of, like, what's the perfect blend of power and control? Like, I don't want a data center in my house. Maybe when we get them down to toaster size, right? I, I would. But, um, you know, it's, but you, I do want control over my experience when I use computers. So, um, so then the market decided to provide this solution, which is like, cool, you would have all the power, I mean, all of the computing power and none of the control, which is like, uh, well, it's like not the best deal, right? Um, and you know, if you're if you're lucky, you're the person that is like, oh, actually, I love it when Facebook just takes care of everything for me, or actually, I love it when Google randomly decides which documents I don't need anymore and, and puts them in another folder where I can't find them. Like that is that's my favorite. Um, <laughs> Most people find that they would prefer to have some more control over their experience. And unfortunately, like I said, the market, I think, drives this because um, capitalism is, the, like, it's, it makes the most money when you can do the least amount of work and sell the most things, right? Okay, so... Um, John Mad Dog Hall gives this talk about early computing and um, specifically looking at the ratio of computer software builders to computer software users. And the ratio used to be about like one to like 50 and then a little bit later like one to 100. You know, so if the software wasn't doing what you wanted, like you could call up like on a landline and say, hey, I don't like how the software is working. Can you fix it for me? And they would be like, oh, well, there's only 100 people using this software, and they all pay a couple hundred dollars for it, so yeah, I'll fix it for you, which is pretty great, right? So you have a, like, a high amount of like, accountability and access to the people who build the software that you rely on that you use to do all of your work. So capitalism made this more efficient by making the ratio more like 1 to 1,000 or maybe 1 to 10,000. And if you think you can get one of those people on the phone, well... Not unless you're like, maybe if you're paying $2 million or it's your company and the people who built the software actually work for you, and then you might be able to get them on the phone. Although I find that it's hard to get any engineers on the phone. Um, <laughs> seem to not really like the phone. Uh, but uh, so this means solutions that are centralized, one size fits all, um, not responsive, and not accountable to individual computer users, which... I think is is not good. Remember when we were gonna like, you know, expand our minds and do whatever we wanted with computing, um, and now we have Twitter. <laughs> so, um, where you can argue with strangers on the internet for free. Um, mm, we could there could be more, I think. And our computer usage is becoming more and more personal. It's getting into like more nooks and crannies. Sometimes literal nooks and crannies, like in our bodies, right? Um, and uh, does anyone use like a pacemaker that's got software in it? Or like a, uh, an insulin pump that has software? Yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's, it's in there. <laughs> um, so what I, think is, what I think is kind of interesting about that is, you know, as we are having more implanted medical devices and machines in our homes that have access to like our moods, like did anyone see the thing about how Alexa can tell when you're depressed? Yeah, it turns out it's actually like, <laughs> it's actually not uh, rocket science to figure out when people are depressed. Their voices change, their questions change. And um, 
you know, there's, uh, there's lots of things that people are more susceptible to buying when they're depressed. Um, so if you have a device in your house that knows what your mood is and controls the ads that goes to you all over the internet, if you haven't installed NoScript um, and Privacy Badger, then, you know, you, this is a very intimate relationship, right? Um, but I think, I think it's important for us as users to shape that experience for ourselves. So what if you could take it with you? What if you could have the control of having devices in your body, but you had control over the data and who had access to it? That's like what I want to see. That's what I think uh, we should be working for. And not just here in the US. We're going to get to the global part in a minute. Um, and I think, I hope that pendulum swings back to where we have like a high amount of control. It's like, I'm just picking up like everything about me and I can take it, it fits in a suitcase or a virtual suitcase. Um, but it's not going to be easy because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, like, network effects. Like, um, social media, like, doesn't really work if you're the only one on there. Um, be my friend on Mastodon. <laughs> um, I have 31 friends on Mastodon, I think. Um, and it was hard. That was actually <laughs> difficult because it's decentralized. And it's, I don't think it's me. <laughs> like, I have more friends on other networks. But, um... It's, uh, but it won't be easy uh, because uh, the, the network effects and um, I don't know if you know this, but like when people have like financial incentive, it can be pretty hard to like go upstream and turn the tide there. And we talked about how capitalism and centralization go really well hand in hand. So not only that, <laughs> uh, harmonization or what else we're up against as far as the legal stuff. So in addition to like everyone you know being like, why do you not put pictures of the cat on Facebook or whatever, um, you also have uh, a whole array of folks that uh, work at companies that are invested in having you use only their specific software. Um, and in fact, there are five different patent offices that are invested in having a specific definition for the scope of patentability that is not quite lockstep, but very, very similar. Um, the IP5 is uh, US, Japan, China, the European Patent Office, and South Korea. And, um, you know, so they, they've got this idea like, hey, so software, we should be able to patent it because, well, it turns out we can charge people once we get patents on it, and that works out really well, and then we can keep it so that other people don't use the software that we made, and we get to contain all of it and hold a monopoly on it. Um, these companies, I mean, these countries don't even all agree with each other, though, exactly. Um, amongst the IP5 uh, patent offices, Japan is widely considered to be the most, like, suspicious. Like, yeah, that doesn't sound like a thing. You don't get a patent for that. Whereas the U.S. and China are like, did someone say computer? Yeah, have it. Oh, yeah, patent. Um, do you have some other stuff you want to just, like, jot down on a napkin while you're here? Um, <laughs> Not quite. You, it's a form, but um, but it's very it's it's fairly similar. Um, and then uh, and then Korea and, and Europe are sort of in the middle, where they're like, okay, a little suspicious, but not uh, not quite as suspicious as Japan. So there is some leeway already in there, like the 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 harmonization even like amongst those five powerful nations that trade with each other a lot uh, isn't completely a hundred percent locked up yet. Now, just to be clear, I don't think patent quality is the end-all, be-all in this discussion. It's important, and um, frivolous, poorly written patents create a chilling effect on developers and smaller startups and uh, in a lot of different ways. Like, not even for the troll problem, which is its own thing, um, but for uh, what I like to think of as sort of like bad actors in the space who are like, oh... Um, it looks like you're going to get customers for something that we thought maybe one day we'd have customers for, but we didn't build that software yet. But I think we have a patent that reads close enough on that to keep you from getting to market for six months while we <coughs> implement your idea. It, you won't win in court, and that's okay because we don't care. We just want to keep you from getting to market first. And those are practicing entities. Those aren't even trolls. Um, so patent quality would help us with that issue in particular.
So, um, so I don't think it's the only issue. We're going to talk about some other stuff, but I do think it's important to uh, to consider that you know we should we should not have like garbage patents that are basically like I have a database and I wrote a script so it can talk to a website, and it's like oh, and then I covered it with like another forty pages of verbiage with computer words. Can I have a patent? So I think we could do better than that, is what I'm saying. And, and I don't think that we should be exporting that amazing scope of patentability to other nations. So, um, so when I look at how the different, when you look at how the different countries interact with each other, it turns out to be a lot of like who you know. Um, and it's, um, once there's like a financial relationship, then the, the richer country often has an opportunity to be like, we don't feel comfortable with your scope of patentability, as you know, as a trade partner, say. And so they, they have a certain amount of leverage. And it matters like who you know, and so there, there's a couple axes that that works on. Um, some of it is geography and culture, so you see like, you know, a lot of trade and similar ideas around the scope of patentability and like how industry should work in like Asia and like, uh, you know, European countries are all one patent office now. Um, and some of them are uh, historical relationships. Like when you look at how various African nations have approached IP and internationalization with uh, their trade partners, it usually goes back to a colonial relationship. So it's like, Oh, French-speaking countries tend to have like a very similar to France's idea around like what the scope of patentability should be, um, and different things like that. It's um, it, uh, it, it it it's like they kind of they're like oh we understand each other, and a lot of times like the law is very similar there. So um, the way that the law works in a lot of the Western world is that it's supposed to rest on precedent. So like you even see stuff in the U.S. where it's like you know, basically, like, a case will go back to, like, well, what would England have done? And it's like, why do we care what England would have done in the 1500s? And it's like, well, because otherwise we have to just make it up and admit that's what we're doing. And it's like, but we are, I mean, we're going back to, we're cherry picking from the 1500s in the English law system. And it's like, yes, but we're not making it up from nothing. Yeah. Which is like, okay, um, I guess so. I guess that's okay. I guess that makes more sense somehow. Precedent? Yes. Uh, yes, there's a word for it. <laughs> there's an amazing amount of creativity um, still within that system because there is so much precedent that you could pick from. Um, another way that you see sort of these relationships where one country is sort of leans on another to be like, oh, don't you think this should be patentable? is when they build something collective together. So um, for smartphones, a lot of the software comes from uh, Europe or from the US, but the phones themselves are made in Asia, in China and Korea uh, and some of the Southeast Asian countries. And so, um, so you see this kind of like, that's why the IP5 is split between like, you know, US, Europe, and then everywhere smartphones are made and put together. So, um, so when you see like a common a combination product that contains components or intellectual property from several different countries, you tend to see like some pressure like let's all get on the same page, let's all harmonize with this uh, with the idea of what we all consider patentable together. So the resistance. This is this is a good part. That's, that's all kind of depressing, right? Um, so uh, well, it's us. Uh, but it's not only us. They're actually like freedom-loving people, like fans of local sovereignty, people who want to see local industry uh, succeed and thrive in other places, which is great. Um, so, uh, so we're going to go through some of that and who uh, and what people are doing in different places. So, uh, so one thing that we've seen a lot of is uh, where activists have worked to improve the scope of patentability locally. So, New Zealand is such a place. Um, the folks in New Zealand, they were like, hey, software patents are really annoying, especially for people doing free and open source software. Let's go, let's go buy ties and go down to our legislative body and talk to them about that. 
uh, it took a couple visits. It didn't, it wasn't just, <laughs> I don't want to stand out of like, oh, it's just we're one visit away from um, removing patents, uh, software patents from the scope of uh, patentable stuff. But, uh, you know, they went again and again. It took a couple years. And then finally New Zealand was like, software patents are not a thing here. Yay, go New Zealand. Um, India also did a similar thing. Um, uh, they probably actually already had ties, but uh, New Zealand's very, like, if you've ever been to New Zealand, it feels like a, like kind of a surf town from the 80s, like the whole country, because surfing's a big deal there. Um, so uh, not typically big on formal uh, office attire, <laughs> at least not the free software activists. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so this is a strategy that has been used in other places and could be used in still more places improving the scope of patentability locally by going down and lobbying and talking to elected officials. When I talk to folks in uh, like New Zealand and then it's like, oh, how come you guys haven't done that in Australia yet? And they're like, you know they're much, much, much bigger. I'm like, oh, right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so this might work, this will take less time for smaller countries than for larger countries. Um, so, uh, so New Zealand was a little bit easier to get access to politicians than um, all of like the U.S. Congress or all of the Australian Parliament. So, um, so but you know there may yet be more places we could do this. Uh, there are things that we don't have laws about yet. Uh, some of the things that uh, people are discussing in the abstract now, but will eventually um, start codifying, are what goes on with 3D printing when you talk about like, well, who owns the is it a design patent or is it a copyright because it's instructions or is it a patent because the thing, like a functional patent because the thing you print does something? Which is it? Should it be an unholy mess of all three? If we're not careful, we might end up with that. Uh, I hope we don't, <laughs> but, but we already talked about how much people really love precedent and reusing stuff in the, uh, in the legal field. So. That could happen. Um, so I think there's some opportunity there for some things that we don't have laws about yet. Um, also, uh, it seems like uh, I think that the uh, economic power has a lot to do with how much power you have to decide what the scope of patentability is, how you participate in trade agreements. And so, you know, you can see like, oh, um, with the U.S. being here with a huge amount of the um, global GDP, like they have a lot of power to ex we have, you know have a lot of power to export our, our ideas about what should be patentable and what um, what trade relationships should look like in the world, but you know there's other places where it's like well you know we still have some opportunity to you know like especially here where uh, people are there are a lot of people that don't yet have smartphones but they're about to in the next like ten or twenty years and so there's a lot of opportunity in some of those places to. Um, <clears throat> to work on like, hey, like, don't take our mistakes, learn from our mistakes, and tell us to like, screw off with our stupid sweeping trade agreements. Um, uh, you, you could put it nicer probably, I guess. Um, another way that, um, that folks have been pushing back and resisting this harmonization is anti-competition, uh, either commissions or laws and things like that. And so uh, we do have laws here in the United States against monopolies. Um, a lot of them are weirdly outdated and not well suited to the digital era, unsurprising, um, but uh, we do have laws against them, so uh, that's, that's something that we could, we could do. Um, and a lot of other countries have uh, like anti-monopoly uh, agencies. Uh, ours is the FTC, which has tried really hard to be like, we have some ideas about how we could be helpful here. They've like, I think every couple years they put out like a 350 page paper, like just like, hey guys, on the patentability of software, we had some thoughts. Mm -hmm. If you decided that we could have some power in this area, which we really think you should do. Um, they haven't been given a lot of power in that area, but they still keep producing the reports, which is nice, so they're, they're ready. Um, <laughs> But uh, other countries and places have had much more luck. So the, the Competition Commission of India, so we already know like India doesn't have software patents or, uh, as such. Um, they're not quite as like, no, nothing as New Zealand, but they're pretty close. Um, and most of the people in India themselves do not get software patents and, or patents at all for their inventions. So they don't have like a lot of patenting culture. 
but they do have this national agency that is supposed to make sure that competition is able to happen, which is great because um, they had these $5 phones uh, for a long time. So these, uh, the, I was, when I kind of was digging into this, it was like, um, it turns out that the famous $5 phone was actually uh, retailed at an introductory rate of $3.60. Um, but after that, now it's a $7 phone, just so you know, <laughs> in case you're going to pick one up. Um, but, um, you know, and, and uh, the, difference, uh, the difference between the, no the number of people who are able to now have smartphones when they were available for between three and seven dollars was huge. It had a huge impact on the Indian economy. And um, so uh, Sony Ericsson, which is a Scandinavian country, came and they're like, oh, we belong to this international standard setting organization around smartphones. You probably just forgot to let us know that you're using a bunch of our patented stuff. You know, like a device that fits in your hand, a speaker for telephones, and you know, like essential patents like that. Uh, and, but don't worry, we can let you use them for a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory fee. So, um, so a, a smartphone in Scandinavia costs at least as much as one here in the U.S. They actually have higher taxes, so it's probably hundred bucks more, even for like a, you know, an Android, not just an iPhone. Um, were the odds that anything that is a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory fee for an $800 phone makes any sense at all for a $7 phone? If it's a percentage of the cost, then maybe. If it's a fixed number, then no. Yeah, the margin on a $7 phone is pretty low. Um, the, uh, like, apparently, like, and you, it, I try to get a better picture, but, like, um, have you ever eaten Tic Tacs? Okay. Uh, these would be a slightly less good box, <laughs> right? So, because it's a seven dollar phone, like you know, um, so it's uh, yeah. The margin is very, very low. So the Competition Commission of India was like, yeah, that sounds like monopolistic behavior, and we're set up to say no to that. So I'm sorry, Sony, we're not going to do it. But. Um, you know, maybe for your trouble, we'll do like a one-time fee. They didn't want to completely invoke the rats, so they did a lot of like, like, oh, we'll have some hearings, and we'll, we'll do some research, and we'll look at things. And, and yes, it, it does seem like a, like a one-time fee probably makes the most sense. Uh, we're not going to call it hush money or go away money, but that is kind of what we're hoping will happen. And sony has been down there now like at least three times to try and sue uh, for standards essential patents on these very cheap phones. And the Competition Commission of India has said every time, like, um, how about like just a little cash for now and you'll go away each time, which is amazing. Um, because, the, the you danger know. with all of this, one of the dangers with all of this uh, obsessive worry about patents is that we will continue to tell countries that they shouldn't be doing that and they're they're smart people and they will just develop their own industry and do it themselves yeah Intel used to be able to sell supercomputer chips to China and then they got pissy about it and said no we're not going to sell you that so the Chinese made their own yeah well and actually that's where we're going next is that uh, so the Indian phones are, uh, like I said, not a super high quality box. Um, so a Chinese company came in and said, like, we can come somewhere in the middle. Now remember, China is one of the IP5 uh, patent offices. We can sell you, like, a phone with a little bit more metal in it. Not metal, but, you know, metal. Um, for 20 bucks. And people were like, whoa. And it's sinking the $7 phone industries. Um, which is like, you know, I mean, some people will, like, there will always be people who are, like, kind of having a rough month, year, decade that will go for the, the cheapest thing. I've been there, you know, I went, you know, um, but, uh, but this may change the Competition Commission's, uh, zealousness for protecting the local smartphone industry because, um, before the $7 phone, lots of people in India didn't have phones at all. Because they, they're like the idea of even a two or three hundred dollar phone was just completely out of reach. 
the $20 phone is actually within reach, right, for a lot of people. And so uh, by undercutting the, you know, the Western phones and the phones that people buy in Europe and in the U.S., um, they were able to kind of like torpedo that market. So the Indian Competition Commission's uh, real power comes from we're protecting our local industry, right? And so they're no longer you know, that's no longer the big player and the big game changer that it was. So they may be losing their hold on being able to tell Sony to go away. Um, or their, you know, their backbone in that way. Um, and so, uh, so we'll see. It's still playing out. The, these have not been on the market for very long, so we'll see. But uh, speaking of the economic power that comes with the building of things, um, there are a lot of smaller... Um, Southeast Asian countries where they make cars or parts of cars um, that don't, we don't have a firm set idea on what their patent offices are like or even if they have a patent office and what their response is going to be to this global push to harmonize with like China and Japan and Korea and the US and Europe. Um, depending on what parts of the car they make that might have a lot to say about it. It also, you know, uh, many modern cars that have an operating system in it have an operating system that rests on the Linux kernel. So like they may be very invested in making sure that the collaboration that's available with free software remains available. Um, they're making more like a physical component. They may feel less, you know, less, uh, you know, inclined to that direction. So that still remains to be seen. Um, but uh, one thing I think that is really interesting is that uh, the conversation around uh, standards essential patents and standard setting organizations has been very interesting. So uh, this is, I want to make sure I get this name right. Um, so this person works at Qualcomm, which owns a lot of patents, um, and a lot of standards essential patents in particular. And so, um, they wrote a really long, like they partnered with some academics, they wrote a really long paper saying like, courts should uh, reject pleas to impose special rules or burdens for proof of conduct for standards of central patents. Basically this is saying like, hey, just because we hold all the cards are making everybody pay us for our standards of central patents, like you should leave us alone and stop bothering us courts because everything is working just fine. <laughs> These are not the SEPs you're looking for. <laughs> and so, and uh, to me, I was like, really? So Qualcomm and their pals would like the courts to be really nice to them and leave SEPs alone. It's sort of this, like, we're the experts on making ourselves money. I mean, <laughs> on what should be a standards essential patent. And so you should just leave us to this thing we're very good at. Um, to which I say, like, when someone says, pay no attention to the cookies in these jars, we should open those jars and liberate those cookies. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's, so, th like, it, I, I kind of did that, um, what's the Barbara Streisand effect? By writing this paper about, like, hey, courts should be really, really nice to SEPs or else bad stuff could happen, love Qualcomm. Um, it's sort of like, huh. So maybe we should be looking at what the courts are doing and how we're treating standards essential patent organizations. Okay, thank you for the tip. Um, and it turns out that uh, other people had already gotten this memo. Uh, the UN has convened a competition conference on international cooperation and competition. Anyway, that's a, they didn't make an acronym out of it, thankfully. Um, but, the, but anyway, so BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, and South Africa. And um, so they've been having this conference for the last five years about like how do you keep um, how do you keep competition from being snuffed out by bigger bullyish countries? How do you keep um, how do you run your anti-monopoly enforcement so that it's effective and protects your local industry? So they've been having this conference for five years like so other people in other places know this they've been talking about like basically like how do we keep you know Europe and the US from like steamrolling our local industry um, and build like a competition commission with like some real backbone so that's exciting um, even um, oh, whoops sorry we missed one um, okay uh, 
even in Europe, there's been like some back and forth. Uh, so, um, so this was Unordered Planner versus Huawei, and the conversation was like, oh, hey, can we license that Sears Essential patent? And the patent owner was like, just didn't get back to them for a really long time, and so they're like, if it's if it's a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory rate, like you can't just not respond when we ask for a license, um, and. It was sort of a new thing for the court to be able to like to be in a position to say like no really you have to respond in a timely fashion you can't just say like oh yeah anyone can take a license as long as you show up on an odd numbered month on Thursday before seven a.m. like that's not an acceptable way to offer your, a license on your standards essential patents um, but in other parts of Europe they've uh, they've kind of gone the other direction so it's like kind of goes back and forth. Um, they have one patent office, but the court systems respond and interpret the uh, dictates of what's patentability, what, what falls within the scope of patentability, and how standards essential patent owners should be treated. Like, so that the court system varies by country, but they have the same patent office, so it's kind of a mess. But, um, but there, is been, there has been some push to, like, yes, we, you guys have a lot of money and a lot of power. Perhaps we should be paying a little more attention to what you're up to, which I think is good. Um, so, so that's kind of like a little bit of what's going on in, in uh, a number of different places. Um, and then how can we affect what's going on globally from here at home? And uh, so, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement uh, was shot down. Apparently all we have to do when we have like an overbearing, uh, sweeping trade agreement being negotiated in secret is uh, threaten to elect a clown. Um, this has had a lot of collateral damage. I don't recommend reusing this policy. Um, but, um, you know, so that was, anyway, the TPP had, as a, particularly, just for the staying on topic part, had a lot of, like, particularly bad stuff as far as, like, freezing in time, like, the most zealous scope of patentability for patents, uh, for software, and then also, like, the longest copyright um, time available, and, and it had a lot of other, like, retaliatory clauses in there that said like, oh, if you don't let us do the things that we want to do, then you just have to pay us for all the money that we would have gotten if you'd done the things that, you know, we wanted you to do. <coughs> and we have some, we have some precedents for this actually too. Like, so uh, Eli Lilly, which is a pharmaceutical company, um, they did this thing that pharma often does where you have a 20 year patent for one drug and then you change a non-active molecule, you apply for another patent on the exact same drug um, except for the non-active part of the molecule. And then you ask for a new 20-year, like, exclusive patent lease on that. Um, Canada said no. And Elon Lee said, that's not what NAFTA says. NAFTA says you have to give us whatever patents we want. And they probably didn't say it in that voice. But that's how I heard it when I was reading. Um, and so they sued Canada. And they're like, for 20 years worth of the, like, another patent on this drug. Um, that court case is taking forever. I wish I could tell you how it turned out. But, um, you know, so still not decided. But there was similar language in the TPP about how that would be the case for software patents and for other, uh, you know, intellectual property that affects our ability to build free software and technology and have local sovereignty over our um, economy. So, um, so, interestingly enough, there's like a kind of a sister agreement under discussion, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, uh, which would be between the European Union and the United States. So we'll see. There hasn't been a lot of movement on that one since 2017 either. It's sort of like we just aren't getting things done anymore. But, um, you know, so, but like the TPP, the TTIP is, um, there's a lot of powerful people involved in this conversation, so I don't, it, it might go away for a little while, but I don't think it will not come back. It will be, it'll be like Arnold Schwarzenegger at the end of the movie. It will definitely be back. Um, they might call it something else, you know, but uh, it'll definitely be back. So some of the things that um, make it, so some of the ways in that we might think about how to argue for, um, for leniency or, uh, you know, places where we, we don't allow, like, a complete monopoly control um, have to do with when it 
interfaces directly with people's health and well-being. So the Marrakesh miracle is um, when a sympathetic good is at stake, uh, even the U.S. patent courts can be uh, made to be sympathetic. And this was about um, uh, people, uh, people who are legally blind being able to read. And they were saying, like, perhaps the most extreme and prejudicial application of copyright shouldn't apply when we're making it so that people who are legally blind can have books read to them. So like when you can make like a very human case, like uh, then you, we can, we see some movement and some sympathy. The courts, uh, and in particular the US courts, like hate to be like, yeah, so we ruled for the faceless corporation and not the sick people. They, they like hate to bring that news. So if we look for places in case where we can make the case like, no, no, this is actually harming real people, sympathetic people, nice people that we want to have things and have good lives, um, then there, there can be some pushes to, uh, to make things better. The um, Prometheus versus Mayo is a, a case like this where it was like a large uh, company that had produced a drug and a delivery method which involved injecting the drug in, waiting, checking the level of a particular chemical in the body and then deciding should more drug be administered or not. Um, which, <laughs> anyway, so Prometheus sued this clinic where people who can't afford to pay were going to get this treatment. And it's like a, it's a treatment for people who uh, are pretty sick and don't have a lot of other options. And so the courts were like, you know, generally we love patents and we even love pharmaceutical patents, but like we hate the press that comes with letting poor sick people die. So we're going to rule with the clinic instead of with Prometheus here. So there is opportunities there is what I'm saying. Um, and of course we can always build alternatives. Um, we talked a lot about like, uh, you know, the, the, the smartphone, like if it was, if there was an all free software smartphone on the on the market, like we could just be like, well, we no longer care what Apple's up to or how they're arguing for intellectual property rights. Um, so we could do that. I mean, I, I say that it's, I know it's hard. It's, 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 uh, but some specific things, I'm glad that Michael's here because um, he works at the Digital Impact Alliance, which is working on platforms that empower people to uh, build local industries around open source software. And you could probably ask him about him after this. Um, but if you make the platform, then people just build their little piece that plugs into it. And if the platform that you build that is empowering people is also free software and is unencumbered by patents, et cetera, et cetera, then you've done a, a good thing. So you could, that's one way that we might think of like one project that has a lot of impact to empower people to work on smaller projects so that you end up with an ecosystem of those things. Some of the other stuff that tends to like fly under the radar of like huge multinational corporations is hyperlocal stuff. So there's been a lot of like different places where people are looking at like smart cities and things that work like for their specific community. If you make these empowering hyperlocal systems open source, then people can take them to other places and we could begin to pull some of our business and some of our stuff away from these multinational corporations that would like us to harmonize with them. Um, maybe even personal stuff. So, um, you know, some of the, like, the wearables and the medical devices, there are communities where people are working to make open source alternatives to those things. Um, this, is a, this is probably, you know, a little more manageable than, like, figuring out how to get a company in China to send, like, 50 million smartphones to the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, so there are places where that can be done, and then you share your results. Other individual people can share them as well. And, um, and we might have to continue building stuff that's an alternative to the, like, one-size-fits-none, like social media. Um, like I said, you can be my friend on Mastodon. Um, I'm on, like, I think it's Bacon and Coke. No, Free Dev at Free Radical Zone. Um, or dot zone. Um, anyway, so I, we, I think we have to continue building these alternatives so that we can start to pull stuff away from like uh, Google and Facebook and those places that give us the one size and it fits none. And again, this is big. Like it's going to take a long time to do that, right? Um, but uh, I think it's good work. I think we can we can do some of it. And maybe 
who knows, maybe you'll end up being the person who worked on like one thing that got close but didn't work, but then the next person will be like, well, at least we're not to start over from scratch. Like we can build on the thing that you made that didn't quite cross the finish line and get users and, you know. So, I mean, it's not a glamorous place to be, a footnote in history of like, oh, we made the thing before the thing that worked, but, you know, you can sleep well at night knowing that you did a good thing. So, in conclusion, um, you know, should we build stuff or try to influence policy? And I think that's, you might as well ask, is the sun hot or bright? Obviously, we have to do both. Um, some of us may be like, I think I might be better at one than the other. Um, and that's okay. But as a community as a whole, we'll probably have to do both. Um, if you like reading about this type of stuff, uh, low-quality patents, I have a paper for you. And I'll put these up on SlideShare, too, but you can also take a picture because it might take me a couple days because the Wi-Fi is real slow here. Um, the telecom patents and friends, uh, good pun there. And then uh, the paper on Snyder's Essential Patents, where Qualcomm says you should absolutely make sure to be very nice to Snyder's Essential Patent owners. So, um, if, you, if you like reading stuff ironically in that way. Uh, and obviously, for, uh, I'll, I'll move this in a sec. Everyone's got what they got? Okay. Um, obviously, I have picture credits because, you know, I don't want people to think I'm stealing this stuff. And then I would be happy to take your questions. Thanks so much. Yes, sir. Is, is, is standard essential patents different than a regular patent? Yeah, so a standard essential patent, thanks for, I didn't, I didn't quite uh, point that out. Um, a standard essential patent is something that would be hard to build the device without. So, like, for a smartphone, um, not having a speaker that you could, t like, could talk into, um, not having a display, not having the ability to dial, you can't really call it a phone without any of those things. So that's, like, an essential patent. Um, having the rounded corners apparently is optimal, you, option, you know. Is, is that a um, formal designation given by the patent office or is that? Oh, that okay. Or? So there is, um, there's legislation that says if you hold a standards essential patent, like a, a patent that, um, without which people could not build a device that fills that niche, then you must make it available at a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory rate to other players in that field. Like, you can ask for money, but it has to be reasonable, and it can't be, um, like, only our friends. So who gets to, to, to declare that as a standard essential patent? Yeah, so that's an interesting thing, because um, usually what happens is the industry sets up a standard setting organization. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's always this trick with government where it's like, well, should government come in and be, like, a half expert at a lot of things, or should we employ people who actually know this field and have them do those things? And it's like, yes, no, maybe, sometimes. So for this, the industry organization is there, but uh, the, what's supposed to keep them in check is that if they are found guilty of like collusion and price fixing and monopolistic behavior, then the FTC or some other government agency is supposed to stop their behavior. Of course, they don't invite anyone from the FTC to their meetings, so we don't always know when they've crossed those lines. So, you know. But then, again, like I said, on the other side, like having like someone from government who does like six other things, like, oh, I'm an expert in patent, you know, in standards in six different fields because we only had money to hire one person. It's like, oh, are they gonna do a great job? I don't know, mm -hmm. probably, probably also not. So but, in that, you know. In that sense, you need transparency and accountability which is not always a thing. Yeah, I know. It's like everyone could learn from us in free software. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, a while ago we they changed the look, they harmonized the U.S. patent, and we, we lost the first to invent in favor of the first to file. Yeah. But apparently, I also heard at the same time, we actually gained a bit on prior art. Can you say a little bit about that? Oh, interesting. Okay, so the question, yeah, so we, the question is about, like, we lost the first to invent versus first to file in order to harmonize with the uh, EU, but um, we gained a little bit on prior art. Um, yes and no. Well, so uh, 
So you can definitely use, uh, so prior art, let me back up a little. Um, prior art means something that shows what has happened before the patent that you're filing. So the question that the patent office is always supposed to be answering is like, so what is the current state of this field of endeavor, this art, um, and is what you're doing appreciably new and different? Um, now for like, so say, and I like this example, like, so when you're underwater basket weaving, that sounds kind of wacky, because you're probably picturing the basket weaver underwater, but actually it's the default way that baskets are made, is you put the strands underwater because it makes them pliable. So, uh, so you would, like, if someone's like, I want a patent on underwater basket weaving, the person at the patent office would be like, no, 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 there's like a ton of YouTube videos of people weaving baskets underwater like that, it, and those would constitute prior art, or websites where people have described that they've done it, or maybe there's a basket weaving monthly magazine or something, you know, or a journal in that particular area. All of those things would constitute prior art that the patent office is supposed to look at and say like, oh, actually the thing that you're trying to get patent on isn't new. So that's what they're looking at. So, so what did we gain on that? What do we, well, um, I think we expanded a little bit the, uh, like, what is able to be considered prior art, and it was maybe made more explicit that stuff from other patent offices around the world counts as prior art here, although people were using that before. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, when you're applying for a patent, we now have um, more opportunities for you to say, like, hey, wait, I actually did that last year, and you could stop a patent before it gets there. The other thing that we gained in the America Invents Act is uh, what's called inter partes review. So if company A sues company B, company B can say like, actually that patent's a big pile of junk that you never should have even gotten. I want the US Patent Office to look at it again in light of the Alice decision. Can you, can you guys take a look at it again and tell me if that should have even been a patent at all? And so those are the things that we gained. Yeah. Um, shortly after the patent office made the decision that software was patentable, mm -hmm. somebody patented the compiler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the reason why they did it is because they were concerned that if they didn't do it, somebody else who was a bad actor would. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a defensive patent. And um, I spent about $50,000 getting my patent, and I'm trying. Which, which didn't work. And I'm trying to think of somebody being so altruistic that they would spend that kind of money for no reason other than it was a good thing to do. That, that really Was it an individual that did that? I, that, that is, I wish I could remember yeah. who it was, because this was back in the 1980s. Oh, okay. But they might have. I mean, someone did... Um, there's this story of a guy who uh, was looking to write down the human genome and like typing like 16 hours a day, ice in his arms, sleeping, doing it again because he thought that someone else was going to patent the human genome and thought it was just a terrible idea. So sometimes there are amazing altruistic people. Um, other times um, industries get together and, uh, and look at a patent and they're like, oh man, that guy who tried to patent brakes on trains, like if he gets a patent on that one, it's going to be really annoying for all of us who own train companies. Let's go ahead and get some patents and hold them in common. And that's actually the idea behind the Open Invention Network in a lot of ways, is like we, we pull all of our patents together so that we all have a license on them, um, and a bad actor from the outside will have a hard time suing us on the... Uh, the subject matter in there, which in this case is like the Linux kernel and GNU and a lot of the Android system stuff. So like sometimes the industry bands together, it might not be obvious from the patent application that like 17 companies collectively funded that person, um, but that may also have been the case. Or maybe maybe he's like the human genome guy and just really, really nice and had the year off. <laughs> <laughs> Must be awesome! Yeah. Has there been any pushback from the U.S. or other countries against New Zealand or India or the countries that have just got, gotten rid of software Yeah, so has there been any pushback? Well, um, so, uh, so the, the pushback for New Zealand was primarily in the form of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. They're like, you're not going to be able to trade with everybody else in the entire Pacific Rim except China because um, that was what the TPP was about. And... Uh, 
you know, if you don't harmonize with us on everything, and yes, we mean also the software patent stuff. So, you know, so New Zealand was having this conversation where they're like, well, we want to be able to sell the wool and the surfboards and stuff, uh, but we don't want the software patents, so what are we going to do? And now it's like off the table, so they're like, <clears throat> so the people who are opposed to software patents in New Zealand are like, oh, whew, you know, but like I said, it may come back. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's difficult. There hasn't been like specific retaliatory things I know of, but they have been pressured to like um, roll back and harmonize in the form of signing a, a multilateral agreement. So, uh, India, I don't know, like, I don't know, Sony Ericsson is probably going to get sick of going down there for Trump change, but um, they don't have the right levers or sovereignty, like, they're not materially involved in their economy enough to have the proper um, economic levers to make India do what they want them to. Yeah. So, like, they're kind of like, but maybe you will want our phones one day and then we won't give them to you, and India's kind of like, for 800 bucks, I don't know, we might not everyone want them. So, I'll take one more and then everyone can go to lunch. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Yeah, go, go ahead in the back. So, I guess my question uh, would be what advice would you have for small startups like a two or three person pre-revenue pre mm -hmm. seed or seed stage startup to engage with uh, organizations like the Open Invention Network and mm -hmm. alternatives to the patent process because I am a founder and in my experience um, having a proprietary IP is sort of the only game in town. People don't want to talk to you unless you have built a wall around something. I don't yeah. like that it's that way. I'd like a better alternative uh, and I'm really curious to find out where people who are, who are coming from an entrepreneurial bent can go. Yeah, so the question is, like, where should, what should startups do to engage with the uh, reality of the patent landscape? Um, uh, and it depends on where you are. Like, if all of your competitors are members of the Open Invention Network, then you should join because um, that will guarantee that your competitors can't sue you for patent infringement on the stuff in the pool. Yeah. Um, yeah, assuming that it's, like, a related field, like something Linux open source software-y. Um, if, if it's a completely different field, I, I don't think there is a defensive patent pool in that way. Uh, another strategy that I have heard uh, that people have used is to do a defensive publication. And, and then they're cheaper than patents. Um, and, uh, and it says like, oh, okay, so it's not a patent, but I am telling the US Patent Office that no one else can have a patent on this because we invented it. And so a lot of companies um, either will do that all as one thing or they'll get a patent on one thing and then kind of like ring it around with a lot of defensive publications. And then I would recommend finding a uh, mutual non-aggression pact for your field like the Open Invention Network. So, um, yeah. So I hope that helps. I want people to be able to go to lunch, but I'll hang out for a couple of minutes if you want to come up and have a question. Um, thank you so much, thank you guys. You.